starting off this countdown, we have the haunted house. In this clip, the Warrens talk about a haunted house that they visited and the creepy things they encountered while there. According to them, someone in the house was using an Ouija board and it opened up a bunch of doors to the spirit world, and that's how it got haunted. Plus, the house was 50 to 60 years old, and for some reason, ghosts like to haunt old houses. Communication, Tony. There had been doors open through Ouija that's boards. That's what I was wondering. But Unlike most times, we do not condone the use of Ouija boards. Well, guess who was using the Ouija board? This girl go down into that hatchway. It was horrible. Both Jennifer and I, at that point, together said, we would not go. Then there was a boy, and the boy was eight years old. Now that girl was coming over to care for that boy. So the young boy and his babysitter were using the Ouija board in the cold cellar and let the spirits into the house. So apparently back in the day, three women used to live in the house along with their mother. While they were living there, they were haunted by a ghost that was killed back in the day. They would see apparitions of this young girl smiling. At first, it was just the mom that would see the ghost, but then one of the other women started seeing the ghostly girl as well. In one case, she actually spoke to her. Then she actually walked over and sat on the bed. I believe there was a conversation between mm -hmm. them. There was a conversation between the two of them, and then this dark form, who we believe to be the person who had perpetrated of, man. It, of this man. That's when they learned that the house was haunted by the girl that was killed and her murderer. The Ouija board had opened the door and those spirits came back to the house. Now here's an image that the Warrens took while on the property. The ghost also manifested itself into orbs as well. So both the photos you just saw are of real ghosts. Coming in at number 4 we have the South End Werewolf. Apparently a lot of demonic activity occurs in Essex, with this being one of two to appear on our list. Born and raised in South End in Essex in the United Kingdom, Bill Ramsey began to experience trouble at the young age of 9 years old. He was outside one day when he began to feel a little strange. An icy blast swept over him and a foul stench appeared causing him to almost vomit. Anger began to take hold and the young boy uprooted a fence post, swinging it around like a club with the fence still attached. It was stated that not even his parents were able to remove the post with their hands. Bill Ramsey then placed the wire meshing of the fence into his mouth and began to chew on it, terrifying his parents in the process who supposedly ran into their home for safety. Following the incident things settled with nothing occurring for 15 years. Bill Ramsey grew up, got married and became a father of three. However, during this time he was plagued by nightmares, waking up in a cold sweat and feeling dread and unease. Once again another 15 years passed with no repeated occurrences of what happened when he was a young boy. That was until 1983 when Bill was out at a pub with a few of his friends. After having a few drinks he began to feel that same chill he experienced when he was young. He went to the bathroom, looked in the mirror and looking back at him was a werewolf. He hopped in a car with a few friends heading home, however he began to growl with his hands twisting into claws and proceeded to try to bite his friends leg. After a handful of incidents that would follow this one, Bill was taken to a psychiatric hospital with doctors being unable to explain his condition. Bill ultimately travelled to the states to meet Ed and Lorraine Warren where a priest performed an exorcism on Bill which supposedly cured him. But not before he partially transformed into a werewolf in front of witnesses. Coming in at number 3 we have the Borley Church Haunting. The Borley Rectory was a home located in Essex, England that gained widespread attention after being dubbed the most haunted home in England. With it being described as such by Harry Price, a psychic researcher. According to reports, the rectory itself has been haunted since it was built, with sudden reports being filed in 1929 after the Daily Mirror published an article detailing the account of a visit by paranormal researcher Harry Price. Now, the first major paranormal event occurred on July 28, 1900, after four daughters of the rector, Henry Dawson Ellis Bull, reported seeing the ghost of a nun not far from their house. However, when they tried to approach, the ghost disappeared. Other people throughout the years complained of similar sightings, including phantom coaches driven by headless horsemen. Freaky. However, let's take a look at the church. The hauntings date back even prior to these occurrences, with folklore claiming that the first haunting occurred in the 14th century following the execution of a nun who had an affair with a monk. The Warrens ended up travelling to Essex to investigate the claims of paranormal activity at the rectory, with people reporting ghostly chanting and organ music, along with sightings of the executed nun and of a ghostly monk. Prior to his death, Ed Warren even claimed to have captured a picture of the ghost monk, showing him leafing through a book inside of the church. 
Borley Church ultimately served as the inspiration for the movie The Nun, which sadly was a major letdown. Also, mostly fiction? Coming in at number two, we have the Lindley Street Haunting. Lorraine and I were in that house for almost three days and nights. We watched as furniture moved around, smashed, broke. People came in and witnessed this, firemen, priests, the home located at 966 Lindley Street in Bridgeport, Connecticut is a truly fascinating story, being dubbed the most haunted house in America, with the Warrens referring to it as, I quote, the most important poltergeist case of the last 100 years. The home belonged to Gerald and Laura Goodwin, who lived there along with their adopted daughter, Marsha. According to reports, several people claimed to see furniture moving on its own accord and a crucifix flying off the wall. For those who know the case, you'll know that one of the key elements of the story is the report that the family cat could speak, with claims surfacing that Sam the cat was caught singing Christmas carols in the family's basement. Now at some point in time, Marsha confessed that the entire thing was a hoax and that she was responsible for the events that occurred, however, the Warrens weren't having any of it, with Ed and Lorraine believing no child was capable of being behind the incidents they witnessed firsthand. Whether you believe it or not, the case is certainly an interesting one that has divided many. I mean, when the Warrens are involved, you know there is going to be some criticism. Also, how do you explain a talking cat? Like if its mouth's opening, it's talking. You know? And finally at number one we've got Amityville, uh, one more that folks will definitely be well acquainted with. Of course we've all heard of the Amityville Horror. There's a lot of history in that home, from the atrocity Ronald DeFeo Jr. committed to the ever controversial claims from the Lutz family. I'm not really sure what would make for the most compelling movie though. I think the true crime crowd would definitely be interested in the inner machinations of a man who decided to kill his entire family in the night. Possibly even more interesting, why would the Lutz family decide that a year after said unfortunate event was the right time to move in? The purported haunting itself and the involvement of the Warrens might play second fiddle if we're being honest. The paranormal aspects have been investigated plenty, so what if we took the skeptical angle and delved into the psyches of those who lived in the house rather than the demons they claim to see. Now that could raise some eyebrows and turn some heads. Personally, I'm very excited to see these ideas in action. However, if they do end up hitting the big screen without a little financial compensation to yours truly, well, they'll be hell to pay. Starting off this countdown, we have the Buddhist exorcism. <laughs> In the early 2000s, the Warrens took a trip to Japan to check out these haunted tunnels that a number of people have died in. But while they were there, they were contacted to perform an exorcism on a woman named Teresa. This footage is very creepy. Not only is it actual footage of someone that is possessed, but you can also hear the demon in her voice reaching out to talk to Lorraine. In this clip, I'm about to show you Lorraine is trying to reach out to Teresa and get her to fight back against the demon possessing her. Teresa, you hear me, you understand me. Teresa, leave. Leave, Teresa. Leave, dear, leave. I'm here to help you. I'm here to help you, Teresa. Things take a turn when Teresa starts speaking in English to Lorraine. I should note that Teresa didn't know English, so clearly it was the demon speaking. You see your mother? Go with your mother, Teresa. Go with your mother. Go with your mother. Go with your mother. Go with your mother. Do you see your mother? Mom, Rose is up Towards the end of the exorcism, Teresa starts lashing out towards Lorraine and others. We see her crawling around and growling like a demon and talking all raspy. I guess the demon was really fighting back because poor Teresa was going through a lot at this point. <laughs> the 
footage ends with Lorraine once again telling Teresa to fight back against the demon. Hopefully they managed to complete this exorcism successfully. Now I tried to google this case but unfortunately there wasn't much information out there on it. So we may never know. In fact it was after this trip in Japan where Ed got really sick and his health started to decline. Maybe this demon had something to do with it. Coming in at number four, we've got poor Frenchie. That's a blast from the past, eh? It's been a while since I've heard of anyone being referred to as Frenchie, but here we are. It's such an old-fashioned nickname, don't you think? Interestingly enough, we've actually seen a bit of Frenchie before in the Conjuring series. He makes a quick appearance in both the original movie, when Ed and Lorraine explain the stages of possession, and again in The Nun. But we want more of the man known as Maurice Thoreau. Kicking this adaptation off easy, there's already a book about this particular case. Known as Satan's Harvest, it draws from a few different accounts of what happened. We get perspective from the Boston Herald reporters who were first on the scene, some accounts from folks close to Frenchie, and of course, the Warrens take on the matter. It's a tale of a Massachusetts farmer who seemed to have two personalities living inside of him. On one side, he was the hardworking, friendly, and all-around amicable guy that many aspire to be. But he had a much darker personality hiding within, one that was terribly abusive towards his children and that he had little to no control over. He first went to the police for help, but they couldn't do much. Then he saw his priest, who wasn't prepared to deal with whatever demons were inside of him. So finally, he contacted Ed and Lorraine, who came through and witnessed the unspeakable. Frenchie was contorting into inhuman shapes, bleeding from the eyes, and covered in raised welts, taking the shapes of crosses and profane phrases in French. At that point, they knew they'd have to bring in an expert exorcist, Bishop Robert McKenna. I think that a movie specifically looking at Frenchie's struggles would be fascinating, especially if the arrival of the Warrens happened later. Like, wouldn't it be interesting to watch as this upstanding, community-driven man realizes there's something dark within him. He's not sure if it's a devil or his own mind, and his family is starting to catch on. He wants to get help, but doesn't know where. A slow descent into madness has been done before, but with a few historical nods and a couple conjuring tie-ins, this could make for some excellent viewing. Coming at number three, we've got the Snedekers. First of all, great name. Snedeker. It's just fun to say. I wonder if that had anything to do with the demons causing untold amounts of pain and misfortune in this family's life. Like, these evil entities were all like, hey, it's the Snedekers. Sounds fun, right? Let's go mess with them. There's a good chance you're already familiar with this particular case. It's extra gruesome with a nice dollop of morbidity for good measure. If you've seen The Haunting in Connecticut, you know the Snedekers. But like most movies made in the early 2000s, there was a bit left to be desired. I'd love to see this flick reimagined with all sorts of additional details, maybe even some flashbacks to the original crimes, because there's a lot going on here. The Snedekers moved to a seemingly normal home in order to be closer to the hospital their son was being treated at. It was a fixer-upper for sure, but the price was right and the location was exactly what they needed. However, the realtors seemed to neglect to tell them that it was once a funeral parlor. And worse yet, the dude who ran it wasn't the most moral of folks. He had been known to do things to the bodies left in his care, and there was talk of other assorted rituals being completed here. So when the Snedekers settled in, they started experiencing unexplainable events. It kicked off with classic poltergeist activity and escalated to full-on assaults. It's a pretty famous story at this point, and would work well within the framework already set up. A lot of paranormal enthusiasts were disappointed in the changes made to complete the haunting in Connecticut, so this is a golden opportunity to rework the story to match the original tale more closely. Coming in at number two, we've got Morley Church. And you might be thinking, hey, They've done this before, and you know what? You're technically right. This is the church that a lot of the stuff that happened in The Nun was based on. But folks love Valak and could use a lot more of this terrifying church-going demon and its contemporaries. The Nun took place, chronologically anyway, way before the Warrens got started with their demonology practice. So what if we got a movie of them returning to this church in their own time? They did travel to England to get a closer look at this haunted spot and even seemed to find out some stuff about the ghosts that lived there. There's a legend of a nun and a monk who carried out an affair and paid the ultimate price. Learning about this steamy romance and then having the Warrens arrive to puzzle out what the haunting was all about could make for some great silver screen action. Find a way to bring in the demon once more and add some other crossover events and you've got a spooky summer blockbuster that'll have fans looking at their local places of worship a little differently. And finally, coming in at number one, we have Satan's Harvest. Now, many will be familiar with the name Maurice Theriot, or more commonly referred to as Frenchie, thanks to the movie The Nun, with the character appearing throughout. However, 
However, I should preface this point by saying that everything that happened in The Nun with Frenchie is in fact fictional, but the character is very much based on a real person. Frenchie was the son of French Canadian farmers in Maine and grew up in a fairly toxic and abusive household, with his father exhibiting violent tendencies towards him. At the age of 51, Frenchie was living in Massachusetts with his wife Nancy and their children. To friends, he was a gentle man and extremely kind to anyone he met. However, behind closed doors, housed something truly evil. He explained that his behavior was the result of being possessed by a demon, which pushed him towards violence. Blood would flow from his eyes, and religious markings began to appear on his body. A local parish priest called in the help of Ed and Lorraine Warren, because, of course, apparently everyone knows Ed and Lorraine. During their investigation, they saw Frenchie bleed from his eyes and saw symbols appear on his body. He also exhibited superhuman strength, which they believe was the result of demonic possession. They specifically believed that Frenchie had fallen into the grip of Satan himself. Three exorcisms were performed on Frenchie, the latter of which proved to be something truly terrifying. Frenchie's face began to change, his skin burned and blistered, and on his forehead a deep wound appeared, and his eyes began to look like snake eyes. However, the exorcism ultimately proved to be a success, with him having no incidents following. In at number 5, Annabelle. The Annabelle doll is the most prominent piece found in the Warren's Occult Museum. Trapped inside a glass case with a sign that reads, Warning, Positively Do Not Open. This Raggedy Ann doll was initially purchased in a thrift store in 1970 by a mother looking for a birthday present for her daughter Donna. Donna, who was in college at the time and shared an apartment with her roommate Angie, loved the doll at first and took it home with her. Over the course of the next few days, Donna and Angie started to notice something odd about the doll. It seemed to move around the house on its own, never where they had left it, and it would change in position. One time they even found it standing on its feet. Then strange messages written on scraps of paper started to appear all over their apartment, looking as if they were written by a child. A bit freaked out, Donna and Angie called immediately who told them that the doll was possessed by a little girl named Annabelle, who had died in their apartment building years ago. Annabelle told the medium that she liked the two girls and wanted to stay with them. The young woman allowed it. But, much to their dismay, they would soon find out that Annabelle wasn't who she said she was. One of their male friends named Lou stayed the night at their apartment and woke up in the middle of the night to find Annabelle next to him, appearing to move. The doll then tried to strangle him and the next morning he woke up to find himself covered in cuts and burns. This is when Donna reached out to a priest, who then brought in the Warrens. The Warrens discovered that the doll wasn't actually Actually possessed at all. Instead, a demon was manipulating it, trying to get close to the girls in an attempt to possess one of them. Ugh, no thanks. Coming in at number four, we've got Lindley Street. Here we have another famous haunted house which would perfectly align with the rest of the series had they not switched it up for The Devil Made Me Do It. I'm sure a return to form would go over just fine though. Moving on from my goofy format based nitpicking, here's a good story. Haunted houses tend to get folks interested in anything, so that's a good start. Also happening in the mid 70s at the time, this was a well publicized poltergeist. Connecticut is famous for all sorts of haunted and damned locations, but Lindley Street is probably one of the most famous. Gerard and Laura Good Win, homeowners and Good Samaritans reported an array of otherworldly attacks in their little bungalow. Windows were broken, furniture was scattered, a cat inexplicably spoke in English, and more. The longer this went on, the more folks became interested. For a while, all sorts of folks that weren't the Goodwins saw these paranormal occurrences too. That's what made this such a high profile haunting. All sorts of reputable and reliable community members claiming to see insane, seemingly impossible things happening in their peaceful neighborhood. News teams, nosy neighbors, firefighters, police squads, priests, and of course the Warrens were called in to see what they could do. And then, just like the neighbors, the policemen and firefighters saw the paranormal experiences happening. So there are a few ways we could approach this tale of terror in a cinematic fashion. There's the obvious way, which is fitting the events into the Conjuring universe and having all sorts of new characters introduced that could have witnessed the haunting. Classic can't miss stuff right there. However, the guy in me who took a bunch of film courses at university makes me want to look at this a little differently. You know, I want to hear all sorts of different perspectives, a bit of he said, she she said, maybe investigate what each individual saw and see if there is an ultimate answer. If I'm being too vague, I'll come right out and say it. Let's make a haunted house Rashomon. Like have the Warrens or some surrogate demonologists come in at the very beginning and ask folks what's happening. Then you get accounts from each invested party and every tale is different in some way or another. And then, as is the case with most real life haunted houses, we don't really come away with a concrete answer just the tales of those who experience it themselves and the tricky job of putting the pieces together ourselves. Think about it. Coming in at number 3, we've got the Donovan family. 
ghosts and romance. Ain't nothing better, right? Plus, when was the last time they made a Spectre filled love story for the big screen? We got warm bodies a while ago, but since then we've really seen nothing new. Maybe a few indie movies where the monsters are surprisingly alluring, and I suppose the shape of water counts for something, but all of those have physical monsters to smush. Lust is a hell of a drug, don't you know? So what if we took the story of a girl summoning a ghost via a Ouija board and then falling in love with it? Well, that's what happened with the Donovan family haunting. Their daughter brought a demon into the house, dated it for a bit, and then realized that it was just using her to sap at the life force of everyone around. Yikes. You've heard of people being used for their bodies or their money, but their life energy? That's gotta sting a little bit. It would be a fun descent into madness, with audiences realizing halfway through that this otherworldly suitor does not have the protagonist's best interests at heart. Definitely worth a rewatch to see what you missed the first time, too. Coming in at number two, we've got the South End Werewolf. Now, we've talked about returning to haunted houses a couple times today with varying results, but what about adding a werewolf story to the Conjuring universe? Now, that's what I'm talking about. The Warrens apparently had a run in with some sort of lichen adjacent during one of their exorcisms. It wasn't a traditional werewolf. Full moons and silver bullets were more or less left out of the equation. But in the case of Bill Ramsey, a hellish transformation apparently did take place. As a kid, Ramsey had a few bestial outbursts, but seemed to chill out as he got a little older. However, out of the blue, an adult Ramsey started acting absolutely feral once more. After a brief stint in a mental hospital, Ramsey linked up with the Warrens and made his way to the States, where a priest was waiting to perform an exorcism. During this ritual, witnesses claimed to have seen him turn partially into some sort of man beast. Now, I'd say if you're gonna make a movie about this, you're gonna need to have a full transformation a couple times, you know, to get that American Werewolf in London vibe. Hell, even the backstory should be him actually contorting into a fanged beast and running Ramsey. Rampant. It won't be all true, but it will make for some excellent popcorn moments. Number one on this list is from the Enfield Poltergeist. Now this story is one of the most famous Ed and Lorraine Warren tales and inspired The Conjuring based on how terrifying it was. If you aren't familiar with this case, then it was centered around a home that had paranormal activity happening from 1977 to 1979. Furniture moving, levitation, and demonic possession, those all took place. Potentially the scariest thing to come out of it though was a recording captured of the demon speaking. Curious to go on that. I did. I went blind. Then I had a name which and I fell asleep and I died in a chair in the corner downstairs. That clip is the demon speaking about how it died in this home. What's absolutely insane though is that was a young girl who was making those sounds. Now how on earth could a child make those sounds and speak that way? The only explanation is that she must have been possessed by a demonic presence. This case got national attention after that recording was released and after hearing it for myself, it makes sense why. At number 5, The Trial of Arne Cheyenne Johnson. Also known as the Devil Made Me Do It case, this is the first recorded court case in United States history that used demonic possession as basis for a defendant's claim that had ultimately resulted in the first degree manslaughter of Connecticut man Alan Bono. It began with the Glatzel family after their 11 year old son David had allegedly been possessed by a demonic beast who assaulted him in an attic. This manifested itself as David began to experience experience night terrors, exhibit strange behaviour and fall victim to unexplained wounds, scratches and bruises. Of course, after calling upon the services of a Catholic priest and finding no resolution, the family contacted Ed and Lorraine Warren. Soon after, Lorraine witnessed a black mist around David, an apparent indication of demonic involvement, as well as red hand marks around his neck, a demon choking him. The Warrens attempted to perform three exorcisms on the boy, where during one attempt, the demon spoke out and said that David's stepfather, Arne Johnson, would commit a murder when the demonic host would go on to possess him itself. Well, that's exactly what happened, strangely enough, and Arn Johnson was convicted of first degree manslaughter and sentenced to 10 to 20 years in prison. He still maintains that he was possessed by a demon to this day, despite the court not believing so. Number four on this list is a clip from another exorcism that Ed and Lorraine were present at. In this video, we're going to see a priest performing the exorcism, and the biggest takeaway that I got from watching this recording was simply how far gone this person who was being possessed actually was. Let's roll the clip. This is the exorcism part right here. You'll see the spittle come out of his mouth.
As we can see in that clip, my guy is drooling and he looks to be in really rough shape. Later in that clip, he looks up and you see his eyes and there just doesn't look to be any semblance of a human being left inside of him. He looks completely gone as if there's no soul present in his body. Apparently he was the target of regular demonic possessions and had to employ Ed and Lorraine's help to try and get the demon out of him. I can't even imagine being so possessed to the point where I'm drooling and seemingly not in control of my thoughts. Really scary stuff. Number three on this list is a clip of Ed Warren talking to a poltergeist in a family home. Apparently this family has been haunted by this ghost for quite some time and have now had to enlist the help of the Warrens to free them from its clutches. In the first clip, Ed is going to be asking the ghost to knock on the walls of the home to answer his questions. Are you a boy? The mother leans against the kitchen table, her hands in full view as Ed continues asking questions. You want the people in this house to move? One knock for yes, two for no. Yes. Okay. As you can see, the mother's hands are in full view of the camera and no one is making the knocking sound. This ghost has also revealed itself to be a young boy who wants this family to get out of his presumed home. I also think that the mother's reaction is extremely chilling and genuine when she says that they tried and they couldn't sell. The clip gets even more chilling as it goes though. And you to reveal your identity. Next, Ed decides to confront the poltergeist alone. Give me some sign. Is that you moving something? Give me some sign that you're here. As we can see in that clip, the chair clearly gets moved by an unseen force. They eventually brought in three exorcists to assist in getting this demon out of the house, and it seemed to work when they did it. However, Ed and Lorraine both admit that sometimes an exorcism can only work to quiet down a ghost and that it can sometimes come back several months or even years later. Number two on this list is some raw footage from an exorcism that Ed and Lorraine performed on a Buddhist monk. This was posted on their official YouTube channel roughly a year ago and it's pretty jarring. Let's roll the first clip. I'm here to help you. I'm here to help you, Teresa. <laughs> I'm here to help you. Please. Think of your mother, Teresa. Do you see your mother? No. Do you see your mother? Your mother. She's talking English, Ed. So as we can see, the person in question is in very serious trauma and their body is squirming in unnatural directions. They seem to calm down at the mention of their mother though, so potentially that's a way to reach the human soul of this individual. As the clip continues, Lorraine attempts to further calm the person with the mention of their mother, but eventually this stops working and the demon takes hold once again. The person is in full distress now, rolling all over the ground, and it seems as if their entire body is in agony. They also don't seem to be making any sense with what they're saying, just strange, unsettling noises. The clip doesn't inform us at the end if the couple were successful in their endeavor to get this person free of this demon, so sadly, we're just left with the horrible image of them demonically twitching on the ground. And finally, at number one, we've got West Point. Unsurprisingly, there are a lot of haunted military academies out there. One of the most famous, and therefore most movie worthy is the West Point Academy in New York. For years, cadets, recruits, superintendents, librarians, and more reported weird goings on. Ghost soldiers would appear before frightened students and items frequently got tossed around. All sorts of colorful undead characters tend to show up here as well. There's the pusher, a chilling apparition that pushes and holds people down in their sleep, rendering them immobile. 
Then there's the ghost cook Molly who is a little disgruntled and likes to rumple bed sheets and smash wine bottles. One of the most famous ghosts here is a soldier turned murderer known as Greer. The Warrens were called in during the 70s to see what they could do about it all and spoke with and did impressions of some of these figures. Any or all of these ghosts would make for a really fun flick filled with poltergeist style scares and ghosts with real personality. Coming at number 5. When they were young. Well, sometimes you close your eyes and see the place where you used to live. This is true of Ed and Lorraine Warren as well. In fact, they were experiencing paranormal happenings way before they were in the spotlight. Looking back at their lives pre-demonology, there were lots of events that seemed to push them towards their career. Call it luck, call it destiny, the world seemed to have a whole lot of unexplainable events in store for the Warrens. Before Lorraine even met Ed and still had her maiden name, she started to see things other people couldn't. At the young age of 9, she began noticing that some people were surrounded by different types of auras. Back then, she just assumed that everyone could see that. However, it became clear that these clairvoyant abilities were specific to her over time. Ed also had some paranormal experiences young, as he claimed that he lived in a haunted house when he was a boy. That kind of experience would drive anyone towards exploration of those kind of themes, right? Doors would open and shut on their own, and sourceless lights would appear in his home. Interesting, right? Well, these early appearances did a lot to inspire the duo to look deeper into the unknown as they aged. However, being young and inexperienced, they were also vulnerable to demonic possession. Neither ever told any stories of being under the influence of an entity while still a child, but they very well could have. A lot of demonic possessions seem to happen in children, whether that means that they're more vulnerable to manipulation or their connection to the spirit world is stronger. So as young folks with a predisposition towards the unknowable side of things, they were at risk of falling under the influence more than most. In in the end, it seems they fortunately avoided such a fate. But the world of demonology and as a result pop culture at large would look a whole lot different if either Ed or Lorraine's experiences were a little darker early on. It's wild to think what kind of cascading effects might have happened had they grown up a little differently. Ed apparently had to jump from a blazing oil tanker while serving in the navy, and while swimming in that frigid water and fighting for his life, he prayed for help and was soon rescued. That near death experience inspired him to profess his love for Lorraine and marry her. Imagine if instead he had questioned his faith or given into darker ways after such an event. Huh. Moving on to number 4 we have the cursed objects and if you guys are liking this video so far then smash that like button because it really helps us out. Many of the objects in this room here um, have had dire effects on people. People have been maimed, have been killed. Uh, People have wound up in mental institutions because of many of the things they write in this building here. Now let's head on over to the Warren's Occult Museum. In this interview, Ed talks about how dangerous their museum really is and the number of people that have died or have been severely harmed after visiting it. Raggedy Ann doll, which was responsible for the death of a young man who came in here one time, <clears throat> uh, who challenged the doll to do its worst, and it did. Then you have a detective. Um, who was almost killed right in this room that we're standing in. Now, the Warrens had a strict set of rules. They told visitors not to touch anything in the museum whatsoever. This is because their aura mingles with the object's aura and it can easily latch onto them. Next thing you know, you're bringing that demon home with you. Anyways, this is the process Ed will take you through if you do end up touching anything. If anybody touches anything in this room, their aura mingles with the aura of that object, mm -hmm. which is very evil. I would then tell them to close their eyes. I would vision them in what we call a Christ light, mm -hmm. make the sign of the cross over them so they take nothing out of here. That's just a precaution that I always use. As cool as the museum sounds, you'd never catch me there. In fact, according to Tony, when he arrived with the camera crew, the spirits were upset and decided to shut off all the lights on them to tell them that they were upset. Well, we're starting to film, you mean. Just as Rob was coming to us to start the interview, every single light went out. Every single light went out without any kind of jolting, just died. And then, what, two minutes later it came back. That was a warning to get out of here. So I think it's just about 9 o'clock at night. I think and it's we time. should leave. The way that Ed said that gives me the creeps. Like, yeah, it's time for you to go. The demons want you gone. Yikes. In our third spot today, we have the Warren's Museum. Again. The Warren's Museum is just 
filled with cursed and deadly items that literally could kill you. In this next video, you'll see just how dangerous and scary the museum really is, if you didn't pick up on that already. You'll be taking a look at one particular doll called the Shadow Doll, or Doll of Shadows. And there are many uh, what we call death dolls here. The doll you see here was made through black magic rituals. It's called a Doll of Shadows. Now, why is it called a Doll of Shadows? We'll take a look at it. This doll is absolutely terrifying. Like, if you thought Annabelle was bad, this doll is a thousand times worse. It has uh, human bones here and there and animal uh, parts all over the body. You notice the nails in here and the tooth sticking out. Well, these are all feathers from crows and whatever. But this, I can tell through psychometry and through how it was made, that it was made with evil purposes. So yes, this doll is composed of human bones and hair and teeth. The owner was using it for dark rituals and in the end, the doll became possessed by a very powerful and malevolent demon. In fact, the way in which this doll was used is horrifying. Now the purpose is this, that they take a picture of this doll, they send it to you, and they put the curse on the back. You take it and you look at it and you laugh at it, but it's not a laughing matter. Because once you see the image of the doll, it can be projected telepathically to you in your dream state. Dolls like this have actually come into nightmares. Did you hear that? That is absolutely horrifying. But that's not all. According to Ed, this doll has killed a number of people in their sleep. These uh, images of these dolls can be so frightening that they've actually stopped people's hearts during the dream state. Ed then goes on to tell how they got possession of the doll. So a couple ended up getting it for sale at an antique shop. The antique dealer practically gave it to them because it's cursed. But eventually, they began to experience intense and horrifying nightmares. They later found out they were having identical nightmares. And one night, the husband woke up with huge gash marks on his back. Uh, the following night, it was not only scratch marks, it was claw marks. And very frightening. And they knew of us, they called me up. I went out there and uh, they said, take this doll, please. The scariest part? The doll can never be destroyed. You see, you must be very careful with a doll like this. You can never destroy it. If you destroy it, you could have things occur to you that would be horrible. Because the spirits that are within the doll then are freed. And where do they go? To the one that destroyed their home. And this is their home right here. And second spot, we have the real life vampires. According to Ed and Lorraine Warren, vampires are real. Ed, I'd like to ask you about vampires just to start right off. Are there such a thing as vampires and can you tell me an example of one? Positively, uh, vampires do exist, what we call human vampires. But they aren't like the stereotypical vampires that we see in movies that are all like, Mwah, I want to suck your blood. You know, have big fangs and a cape, and they don't look like Edward Cullen, sorry. No, they uh, talk about two different types of vampires. The first being someone that hallucinates and imagines themselves as a vampire and just kind of takes on that role. The other is demonstrated by the Albany case from 1953. Where the Calbany family had to open up a grave. Mm -hmm and uh, a family member had died and they were saving a little money by digging the grave themselves. Mm -hmm. When they got down about four foot, they struck a coffin which shouldn't be there. It was their private plot. He goes on to say that the coffin was of antique nature. They opened it up and there was a perfectly preserved man in there. And inside was a man about 45 years old. And he was fresh to the touch as though he had just been buried. Hmm. That's not even the freaky part. So even though the plot was there, there's a law saying you can't exhume the body until you get a court order. So this process took about a week. And when they went back to the grave, the coffin and body had both deteriorated. The mother of the family went back and had the ground consecrated. And then they dug up the grave again, and this time when they opened it up, inside, was a corpse that looked as though it had been buried for many, many years, just a skeleton. The coffin itself had greatly deteriorated. This freaked everyone out. Newspapers got word of the story and it was in the headlines for weeks. People went wild and were like, this is a vampire. 
And they were right. According to the Warrens, the man in the coffin was a sorcerer and user of black magic and also a vampire. He had put himself into a catatonic state. He was alive, but just barely. Still alive, but I'm barely breathing. <laughs> And then at night he would leave the coffin with his astral body and find his prey. His astral body was being connected to his physical body by something Ed refers to as a silver cord. So no matter how far he went, he could still make it back to his body. But while the physical body is still alive, there is a silver cord, a supernatural cord, that emanates from the physical body to the astral body. Mm -hmm. No matter how far away that astral body goes, if you go 3,000 miles, that cord would still be attached. It's only when that cord, that supernatural cord is broken, that death comes to that physical body. Mm -hmm. So somehow that cord got broken and maybe that was when the woman got the land consecrated. And that's why the next time they went to the body, he was just bones. Now you're not going to believe this next part. I mean, it's hard for me to believe, I'm not going to lie. So this vampire dude didn't arise from his tomb and go around biting people's necks to suck their blood. No, no, no. And he would go in search of blood, but he would not bite into anybody's neck. He could take the blood through what we call teleportation, apports. Now today, of course, with all the ways that somebody could get blood, a vampire doesn't have to attack anybody to get that blood. So vampires literally could be real and among us. They just can get blood sneakier ways, like maybe they work at a blood donation center or a hospital or something. Ever think of that? The Warrens did. And in our number one spot today, we have Annabelle the doll. All right, I think one of the most famous would be Annabelle. Mm -hmm. This is a Raggedy Ann doll that's made like thousands of other dolls, except that this doll was used in communication, almost like having a seance. Mm -hmm. In this next interview with Ed and Lorraine Warren, they talk all about Annabelle the doll and her origin story. So story goes that a young nurse received the doll as a gift from her mother. She lived with a fellow nurse. The two worked together and lived together. Well, one morning, the nurse brought down the doll while they were eating breakfast and placed it on a chair at the table. This was meant to be a joke like, oh, haha, ha, she's having breakfast with us. But the next day, she did the same thing. She brought the doll down to the kitchen table and sat her down at a chair. And the next day, and the next day she did this, until something terrifying happened. But the third morning, they're talking to the doll, and the arms of the doll are on the chair like this. Suddenly they went up and onto the table. Now this didn't frighten them, this intrigued them, to the extent that the one nurse said to the other one, one of the nurses knows a medium, let's ask her about this, I'll bet you there's a spirit in that doll. That's what they did. And that was their first mistake. So they did end up taking it to a medium, and the medium informed them that a spirit of a six-year-old girl who had died in a car accident on the road by their house was latched onto this doll. Surely enough, they searched this and a young girl named Annabelle did pass away in an automobile accident near them. But listen to what Ed says here. But God does not allow the spirit of a child to go into a doll. This was a demon who was posing as that little child to create sympathy to these two young women, which it did. It worked, and this demon tricked the girls. They ended up looking after this doll, thinking it was Annabelle, the little girl. They would take it out on excursions, buy it clothes, jewelry, etc. But then it started to attack the girls. The scariest thing occurred when the two nurses came back from their shift. They'd come home after midnight, put the key in the door, unlock the door, and who do you think is standing there? The Raggedy Ann doll. Standing there. Now that doll has flimsy legs. Yeah. If you try to stand it up, you can't. Hearing Ed say this just sent shivers down my spine. Literally. Just imagine going home and seeing that doll standing perfectly upright. The doll later went on to attack one of the nurse's boyfriends by choking him out in his sleep. I dreamt that that doll was strangling me. He had marks on his throat. Was it psychosomatic? Well, let's see. But wait, there's more. The boyfriend ended up picking up the doll and throwing it across the room, and Annabelle did not like this. Picks it up and throws it right across the room. You're nothing but a rag doll. You couldn't hurt anyone. With that, Tony, seven psychic slashes appear on his body. Wow. Now, we've seen these kind of slashes. We've filmed them. 
These slashes come from nowhere. The blood came right through his shirt. Then finally, Ed and Lorraine Warren got involved and took Annabelle to their museum. Coming in number five, we've got Union Cemetery. Well, it was bound to happen. A haunted cemetery. Who would have guessed? That's the thing, too. I feel like so many horror movies over the years just straight up avoid cemeteries. It's always the demons in the house, ghosts in the hotel, apparitions down by the river. You would think it would be a no-brainer to situate a spooky movie in a place populated by mostly people past due, but hey. So this story is quite an interesting one and features the classic woman in white ghost. Known as one of the most haunted cemeteries in America, Union Cemetery sits in Easton, Connecticut. Damn, Connecticut, you really are haunted. So even before the Warrens arrived on the scene, this place had a reputation for the paranormal. All sorts of folks claim to have seen the cemetery's most famous ghost, the White Lady of Easton. Out of context, that might sound scary in a whole other way, but for now, we focus on ghostly details. Her signature trick is to jump in front of moving vehicles near the cemetery, startling drivers and often causing them to veer off the road. When Ed and Lorraine came to visit, they claimed to have seen the White Lady themselves, although not for very long. Ed saw a collection of ghost lights come together to form the shape of a woman, one with dark hair, a white dress, and possibly most startling of all, no facial features. He didn't get a chance to really soak it in though, as when he stepped towards her, she disappeared. A movie that investigated the origins and motivations of just such a ghost would be quite interesting, especially with some real spooky car scenes. What's more is that there's another spirit that seems to haunt Union Cemetery. Visitors have reported seeing glowing red eyes watching them from the bushes as they made their way through. This entity has been aptly named Red Eyes and could add some extra scares and texture to the overall story. Plenty of potential in this tale. In our fourth spot today, we have the Amityville Haunting. And if you guys are liking this video so far, then smash that like button because it really helps us out. This is probably one of the most controversial paranormal cases of all time. On November 13th of 1974, Robert Butch Defoe took the lives of his parents and his two brothers and two sisters. The house was then put up for sale and the Lutz family moved in. And apparently the demon that got Butch to do that horrific deed started to attack this new family. Their doors and cupboards would swing open and close by itself, green slime would ooze from their ceiling, and one time a demonic face with red glowing eyes was seen looking into the house. So on and so on. The Warrens went to investigate and confirmed that the house was haunted. Now I'm sure you've seen the photo of the young boy peering around the corner with scary glowing eyes. Well, let's see what the Warrens have to say about it. Yes, with infrared film. Oh yes. And it's in the upstairs bedrooms. Just to the left there, you see what looks like a small boy's face looking out with bioluminescent eyes, but it is a diabolical spirit with luminescent eyes that appears in that home to confuse the investigators. The photo has always given me the creeps. What I didn't know is that that was of an evil spirit. It, it, you think that is an evil spirit, Ed? Positively. Everything about this house was evil. Again, this is a controversial case because some people believe that the whole story was fake. In fact, Butch's lawyer, William Weber, admitted that he just made up this whole story along with George Lutz. They created the story over many bottles of wine, they said, so they admitted the house was never really haunted. But then how come the Warrens insisted it was? I don't know, just some food for thought. Also, that photo of the ghost boy, terrifying either way. Coming in at number three, we have the ghosts in the cathedral. No, that's if you look at this slide now, I want you to see, no, 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 no. Them. don't do that. Let him see where the man is. There's a yeah. man, he's right there in that picture. I mean, the camera zoom in kind of points out where the ghost is, but if you didn't see it, that is a real life ghost that the Warrens managed to catch on film. Here's a close up of it if you didn't spot it. This one, there, there he is. is. See, right in the oh, corner, yeah. and you see him, and that's in the cathedral. Now, remember that. The cathedrals, well, buildings in the United Kingdom are extremely old. So I clearly see a man in a suit. Hopefully you all see that too. According to the Warrens, tragedy took place in the church and a number of spirits haunt the church. They didn't go into great detail, but back in the day, people actually got burned alive in this church for being part of different Scottish clans, and now their souls haunt it. I think it was the, the McDonald's and the McDonald's, Campbells. Right? Yeah, the McDonald's and the Campbells. And the Campbells were burnt to death in that church, so you can imagine the, the terrible things that go on there. Do you think the most hauntings occur like in places like United Kingdom compared to here? Yes. 
Coming in at number two, we have the Anna Eklund case. In this next video, we see Ed and Lorraine Warren discussing the Anna Eklund case. Anna was an American woman who in 1928 became possessed and underwent a number of exorcisms. During her exorcisms, things would happen like she would hiss or howl like an animal. She would float in the air and whenever holy water would touch her skin, it would burn her skin right off. Let's see what Ed and Lorraine Warren had to say about this case. Now this woman was under possession by her own father and devils from the age of 14. Sadly, her father had taken advantage of her on a number of occasions in which she would try to resist. She didn't want to go along with it, which made him mad and made him start to resent her. He hated her so much that when he died, he actually possessed her with these devils. Right up to the age of 54 when Father Ressinger went to help her. Now she had 30 exorcisms performed, which all failed. That is incredibly messed up, but that's not all. This woman underwent 30 exorcisms. All of them had failed. So they decided to send her to St. Joseph's Church in Iowa to see if they could get the demons out of her. When she arrived, she was placed on a cot in front of nuns. They brought the woman to the convent, and the nuns were all stationed around this woman on a cot. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, a loud bellowing hoarse voice came out of the woman. Terrible obscenities, filthy obscenities came from the woman's mouth. And she rose into the air and went up to the ceiling and clung to the ceiling by her hands and feet. Literally like the scene in The Exorcist. After that, she had to be tied down to the cot. That's not even the worst part. And the nuns constantly were throwing holy water at her. This woman, at ports of what looked like spaghetti and human hair came out of her mouth. That is absolutely disgusting. And apparently she would throw up 20 to 30 times a day. Not only that, but it stunk so bad that the nuns had to take 15 minute shifts with her or else they would fall ill. Imagine how horrific it must have been to be there with Anna and performing this exorcism on her. And in our number one spot today, we have the exorcism. The footage I'm about to share with you is footage of a possessed woman going through an exorcism. It's footage directly from the Warren Files. This exorcism footage is one hour and 20 minutes long. In fact, the footage had been cut down. So that means they were performing an exorcism for over an hour. I will say though that the footage was blurred by Tony Spira before he uploaded it to his YouTube channel. He did this in order to censor some graphic images, but also for the privacy of this woman. Although it's blurred, we can still see how crazy the woman is acting and can hear the weird noises that she is making. So you can see the woman trying to fight back against the demon that is possessing her. And she's crying out in pain from having this demon fighting to stay in her body. So in the footage, you can see Tony Spira holding the poor woman as the demon was controlling her. She can't speak, but she's trying to do so. All that's coming out is gasps for air. But at one point, she points beyond the camera, and Tony knew that the demon was in the room with them and was situated right where the woman was pointing. It gets even creepier when everyone in the room starts chanting along, trying to get this demon out of her, while Tony holds her head up still. It's scary, but it's also really sad. The poor woman was going through so much pain and suffering. Coming in at number five, we've got the Smurl Haunting. Technically, there already is a movie about the Smurl Haunting, titled The Haunted, and released as a made-for-TV movie back in 1991, folks with cable television were treated to a horrifying vision of demonic possession in Pennsylvania. However, we live in the golden age of streaming, with brand new top-notch movies and shows being released almost daily. So with the advances in filmmaking technology and maybe some assistance from the research team at Blumhouse, I think this tale could be brought back to life in incredible fashion. Based on what's happened with the mainline Conjuring series lately, it would be interesting interesting to see a return to a strictly haunted house format, but the story here is rich enough to make it work. Here's the real life story of the Smurls. Hopefully you'll see how it works as a movie. 
In the mid 70s, Janet and Jack Smurl were forced out of their home due to flood damage. They packed up their stuff, got their kids and parents in a car, and moved down to West Pittston. For a while, they focused their energy on fixing the place up. Some painting needed to be done, and old appliances needed to be replaced. Other than that, though, all seemed well. This was short lived, however. Soon, weird things started happening. Tools would disappear without a trace or end up in places far away from where they should be. Stains would seep through brand new coats of paint no matter how thick it was laid on. Kitchen appliances would catch fire even if they weren't plugged in at the time. And of course, terrible smells permeated throughout but would disappear quickly once noticed. Pretty standard haunted stuff if you ask me. But that was just the beginning, as even more noticeable ghastly behavior began. The kids heard disembodied voices that pretended to be their siblings, and Janet insisted that she heard her mother-in-law calling out to her. Dark shapes would float around the house, and one night, one seemed to crawl into bed with the Smurls. Needless to say, they were pretty freaked out. Things hit a fever pitch when the family dog was thrown up against the wall, and Janet was picked up and dangled three feet in the air. At that point, it was time to bring in some help. The Warrens arrived and soon found out that there were three human spirits in the house, accompanied by a malevolent demon. Two of the spirits were harmless and the third one was potentially violent, but the demon was the real problem. It made the other spirits do awful things and intensified the haunting plenty. You can see how this would make for an excellent horror movie, right? We meet the Smurls as they're moving in. Things are hunky-dory. However, the kids notice some strange stuff at night and mom and dad are wondering why their renovations aren't holding up. Then something changes and it is full on haunt mode. Ed and Lorraine show up and the mystery begins to unravel. Tie it in with the other Conjuring flicks and you've got yourself a summer horror blockbuster. Bloom House. Call me. Moving on to number four, we have Scotland's Underground City. And if you guys are liking this video so far, then why don't you hit that like button? And today, there still are. They're our still people. haunted. Yes. yes. There are people like you that see them. In fact, I've never seen them, but there are people that see these ghosts floating about. Mary King's been seen up here, and she's been seen down at the bottom. In 1996, Ed and Lorraine Warren visited Edinburgh in Scotland to investigate an underground city. The city was said to be haunted. In the video, you see an older tour guide telling them about the history of this underground city, how there used to be underground shops and stuff like that down there. At one point, he talked about getting bad vibes from being down there, and apparently Lorraine was sensing that as well. well that's funny, you get the funny feeling. I got funny feeling, all right. However, very bad one by one, they all died off until there was nobody left. It gets worse when he talks about how everyone died down there and there were just piles of bodies because there was no one left to get rid of them. Which is probably why the place is haunted. I mean, a number of people died there and didn't have a proper burial. Well, at one point in the video, Lorraine claims she hears a ghost walking by. Can it be? No. What are you hearing? Um, like the sound of, of, of people, of more than one person together walking by and, you know, like heavy clothing rubbing against each other, that okay. type of thing, I could hear. I'm going home. <laughs> and I could hear that and I wondered, I, I, you, you, you looked, Frank, so I thought you heard the same no, thing. No, I didn't hear it. Yeah. That's not all. She started to pick up on another vibe. It feels like somebody is like squeezing your insides all together, actually. Squeezing the life right out of you. I have no clue how she wasn't scared to death experiencing all of that. Honestly, she was brave. It blows my mind. In our third spot today, we have the family in Connecticut. And no, this isn't the same as the family from the haunting in Connecticut case. Just apparently, Connecticut has a lot of hauntings. So basically, Ed and Lorraine Warren went to Connecticut to help a family whose home was being haunted by a spirit. What I'm about to show you is real footage from this case. Basically, it starts with Ed and Lorraine sitting at a table praying with the family. Then, Ed tries to make contact with whatever is haunting their house. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thank you. One knock for yes, two for no. Are you a man? Are you a boy? One knock for yes, two for no. Yes. Okay. Using that one knock for yes, two knocks for no method, Ed was able to find out more about this ghost. Most here is it? Is it? 
So the ghost was haunting their home and causing a scene because it didn't like the family's mother. But that's not the only ghostly thing that they managed to capture on camera. Later on, Ed asked the ghost to give them a sign, and then the kitchen chair moves on its own. Give me some sign. Is that you moving something? Give me some sign that you're here. I command you to reveal your identity. Yeah, no thank you. If that happened at my house, I would be out of there so fast. In our second spot, we have Maurice Theriel. If you've seen the movie The Nun, then you already know about a man named Maurice or Frenchie. This guy was a hard-working farmer that ended up getting diabolically possessed. This occurred in 1985. Sometimes blood would randomly pour out of his body, like from his nose, eyes, and mouth. And he didn't know what was causing it. He also developed super strength and could randomly understand and speak Latin. At first he went to the police for help, then a priest, and then finally Ed and Lorraine Warren agreed to help him. Now he apparently went through a number of exorcisms. The footage I'm going to share with you is from his last exorcism. So the footage starts off with Ed asking Frenchie to lift up his shirt. Apparently, random crosses would show up engraved in his skin. The Feet up on the shoulder? Yeah. Move, yeah, you're in the way, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. It literally looks like somebody took something sharp and carved crosses into him and then it scarred up. But those would appear all over his body, randomly appearing and disappearing. During this exorcism, a number of scary things happened. For starters, we see him drooling from his mouth. But as soon as the drool hits his shirt, it turns to blood. <laughs> Then, at one point, we see Frenchie hunched over in pain. This is apparently because spirits enter people through their solar plexus. <laughs> And then at another point we see Frenchie become incredibly still and his face changes completely. He doesn't look like himself. His eyes look so glossy. And lastly, we see a cut randomly appear on his forehead and start to bleed on its own, out of nowhere. That is absolutely horrifying. And in our number one spot, we have the unseen tapes. YouTuber Haley Reese got the chance to actually meet up with Tony Spira, the husband of Judy Warren. He provided her with insight into the Warren cases and actually showed her some unseen exorcism footage. She then uploaded this onto YouTube. In this video, we see Tony and Lorraine Warren performing an exorcism on a man named Roberto. Take a look at it. This is the power, Jesus Christ. Okay? You hear me? Jesus Christ has all the power. You have none. What is your name? So in the video, as you just saw, they're trying to find out this demon's name to then help expel it. And guys, you're not gonna believe what demon was inside of him. Here, continue watching. What is your name? Jesus Christ commands you to answer that question. What is your what name? What is your name? Beelzebub? Is that what you're saying? Beelzebub? This dude was possessed by Beelzebub! When I heard that, I literally got shivers down my spine. Like, holy! So for those of you that don't know, in Christian texts, the name Beelzebub is often associated with the devil himself. They would alternate between using this name and Satan. He is considered one of the seven princes of hell, and he is associated with the sin of gluttony. In other texts, he's described as the lieutenant of hell. He's second in power to Satan. It's crazy, but hold on. 
he wasn't just possessed by Beelzebub, but by other entities as well. What other entities inside you? God is commanding you. In the name of Jesus Christ, and all the saints, and all the martyrs, and all the angels command you to answer that question. What is it? I genuinely don't know how they stayed so calm as this dude list all the demons possessing him. The video went on and they found at least four demons were inside of him. They then asked the demons why they were possessing Roberto, and they replied with power. Why are you in Roberto? Why are you there with Roberto? Jesus Christ doesn't like semantic spirits within a human spirit. Jesus Christ hates demonic spirits to be within a human being, you know that? You hate Jesus, huh? I don't know about you, but that creeped me out. It is terrifying. Coming in at 5, the South End Werewolf. This is perhaps the most unusual case on our list. This investigation took the Warrens out of the US into a seaside town in Essex, England, where a man named Bill Ramsey lived, who was believed to be possessed by a demon that manifested as a wolf. Backstory: Growing up, Ramsey was a normal kid. However, one day at the age of 9, he suddenly began to exhibit inhuman qualities. One report stated that while playing outside in his backyard, Ramsey felt a frigid cold overtake him. He was overcome with an awful stench before flying into a rage and uprooting a fence post, gnawing on its wire meshing. He remained incident free up until the 1960s, during which time he was plagued with nightmares, cold sweats and began to wake up panting like a wild animal. In the 1980s, Bill would become overwhelmed by the sensations he experienced when he was young, and at one point he attacked a friend in a car on their way home from a pub, and manhandled the police in an intense altercation. The Warrens were of course called in, during which time they stated that Ramsey would ask to be locked up in a jail cell for his protection and the protection of the public. They ended up asking Ramsey to come to their Connecticut home, where Bishop Robert McKenna would perform a recorded exorcism on Ramsey. And at number 4, Amityville. Here we have a recording of Ed and Lorraine retelling their experience with the famous Amityville house in Long Island. Now, At the time when they were called, they didn't realize that the house had been the location of six previous murders. Here's Ed describing what they experienced when they first got there. We went into the house that day, we didn't realize that it was diabolically infested. He went to that shrine and he brought back from there a priest, an exorcist, who said masses in the house. Why? If this was a hoax that was created by the Lutz family, why six months before this man was murdered in his family, was an exorcist in that house. Eerie stuff. The Amityville horror case has long been criticized as being a hoax perpetuated by the Lutz family. But from what the Warrens claim, it was a sinister place long before the family had the unfortunate luck of moving in there. Up next at three, the haunting in Connecticut. This particular case is concerned with a haunted funeral home, and it happened in 1988. The couple had gotten a call from the homeowners saying that they were being tormented by ghosts to the point where the assaults were even sexual in nature. Now the house had been converted from a funeral home to a regular house before they had bought it, believing that necrophilia had occurred there in the past, the Warrens had this to say about what they discovered there. The instruments they used for embalming, the embalming table, the chain hoist, everything was still there. Mm -hmm. But there was lumber all over. There was also what they called the uh, sales coffin room where they put the caskets. And at number two, the White Lady of Union Cemetery. In East Connecticut, there's a spirit that Ed and Lorraine had made various attempts to capture via psychic photography. According to Ed, people had claimed to see a lady in white walking around the cemetery, so the couple investigated it. Ed stayed in the graveyard for seven nights, leaving his home around midnight each night, and waited with his camera. He tells of how on September 1st at 2.40 a.m., he saw the White Lady. Here's what he had to say about it. I'm sitting there and I could see all these lights over near the Baptist Cemetery, all around the stone wall, and all these thousands and millions of insects were just chirping away. All of a sudden things started to quiet down, and I could hear what sounded like a woman weeping. I took the camera out and I could see all these ghost lights suddenly forming into a figure. Mm -hmm. of a woman. He goes on to say that he wasn't able to see her through his camera, but only with the naked eye. He put his camera on his tripod and let it run, and tried to walk towards her, but she disappeared. So he backed away, and that's when she reappeared. He then saw some shadow ghosts holding her back from him. He claims that a shadow ghost then pushed her towards the road, and then she was gone. And finally, in her number one spot, 
Bill. The Enfield Poltergeist is one of the Warrens' most publicized cases. It was the topic for The Conjuring 2 film, in which we saw the Warrens, played by Patrick Wilson and Vera Famiga, attempt to help the family rid themselves of spirits who were severely haunting them in the late 70s. The film actually used the audio recordings that the duo recorded while at the house as inspiration. Take a listen. As you can hear, the demon's voice is audible talking to Ed. The demon was possessing one of the four children, a girl named Janet, and the voice was said to have been called Bill. This is by far the most famous audio recording of the Warrens. Coming in at number 5, Union Cemetery. Union Cemetery is located near Stepney Road in eastern Connecticut. The site dates back to the 1700s, and according to Ghost Hunters, it is one of the most haunted cemeteries in the entire United States. Now, as you'd expect, Ed and Lorraine Warren were quick to involve themselves in the mystery surrounding the cemetery. Cemetery, with the pair even writing a book about the site entitled Graveyard. According to popular legends, the White Lady Ghost haunts Union Cemetery as well as Stepney Cemetery in Monroe. The White Lady has been seen walking in front of people's cars as they drive along Route 59 late at night. Concerned drivers believed that they had hit a person, exit their vehicles only to discover there was no one there. The White Lady name comes from witnesses who states that she wore either a white gown or what appeared to be a wedding dress. Now in 19 in 1990, Ed and Lorraine Warren set up cameras in the cemetery to record the investigation. Around 2.40 a.m., they heard the sound of a woman weeping, and a female form had begun to move several feet in their direction. As Ed began to approach her, she vanished from sight. Nowadays, the cemetery is known to close after sunset. Number four, the werewolf of London. Well, that's a title if I've ever heard one. Do you know anything about lycanthropy? The supernatural transformation of a person into a wolf? On the other hand, scientifically speaking, defined as clinical lycanthropy, a rare psychiatric disorder that involves the delusion of bestial transformation, often exhibited as a wolf. Meet Bill Ramsey, a London man or wolf who had allegedly demonstrated demonically possessed lichen behavior since the age of nine. In 1983, as a grown man, he admitted himself to an institution desperate to get help for his affliction. According to Bill, he would display superhuman strength and feel a rabid, frenzied urge to bite his family and relatives before succumbing to a strange seizure and convulsion. While in hospital, Bill had an overwhelming craving for blood and went on to attack a nurse while barking like a dog. A few years later, after being released from hospital, he went into a wolf-like rage and attacked a police officer with superhuman force. It took six more police officers to finally restrain the beast, leading to widespread news coverage and mass hysteria of a werewolf in London. Of course, this caught the attention of Ed and Lorraine, and they flew him out to Connecticut, performed an exorcism on the wolf demon, and he was right as rain. Job done. Everyone's a winner. Allegedly. Next up at number three, the Warren Psychic Photography. Although admittedly not a single case, but an exhibition of quite a large number, a technique that was woven by the Warrens throughout their career as paranormal investigators. Now take this with a pinch of salt, because for those that oppose the Warrens' claims, the majority of criticism comes from their specific technique of paranormal photography. The vast majority of the Warrens' physical evidence comes from photography, racking up hundreds of ghost snaps that form the basis of their alleged paranormal evidence, which must fit two specific instructions for it to make the grade. Use an autofocused or fixed focus camera with an automatic flash, and the more power the flash, the better. Supposedly, the more exposition of light, the more successful it will be to catch ghosts, specifically under Lorraine's technique, which pinpoints energy vortices and allows a spirit to manifest itself. They use this technique for the entirety of their career, and it never seemed to change. But for me, it is probably the weakest part of their casework and has the most holes when it comes to credibility. What do you guys think? Swinging in at our number two spot, Union Cemetery. According to local legend, the Union Cemetery in eastern Connecticut dates as far back as the 1700s and is infamous as one of the most haunted cemeteries in the United States. Luckily for them then, that Ed and Lorraine Warren live pretty much next door to this hotspot hive of haunted activity. Very lucky. One of the most notorious ghosts in the graveyard is the White Lady, also known as the Lady in White, a spirit tortured by the tragedy 
of her mortal life. In some legends, the victim of betrayal by her husband, in other cases, murdered by her illicit boyfriend. Well, luckily for us, Ed Warren claimed to have captured footage of the White Lady on camera. He first recorded the White Lady on September 1st, 1990, at around 2.40am, when he heard a woman weeping beyond the gravestones, looked out and saw hundreds of strange lights floating around, which manifested into the figure of a young woman dressed in white with long, dark hair. He screwed up when he walked towards the figure though and the ghost disappeared. According to Ed's advice, you never walk towards the ghost, you let the ghost come towards you because a human can change the molecular and magnetic field when a ghost is materializing. Useful. Well, sounds like crazy footage, right? Something to catch on camera. Well, unfortunately for us, Ed Warren refused to show evidence of this particular video, instead hoarding it for himself, despite urges for it to be analyzed by the scientific community. And finally, coming in at our number one spot, the Snedeker House. This one is pretty messed up, even when you remove the paranormal element. Otherwise known as a haunting in Connecticut, which went on to inspire the Hollywood film of the same name, although Ed and Lorraine reportedly detested the film for its historical inaccuracy, claiming that so much more happened than what the film depicted. According to them, the real story involved the Snedeker family, who purchased their family home at a knockout price due to it serving previously as, wait for it, a funeral home and mortuary. Yeah, you're kind of just asking for it there, really. Not only that, but there was also a graveyard outside. Take the hint. If you take local legend into account, the house was home to some pretty vile deeds where staff at the funeral home were rumored to have been caught in acts of necrophilia, leading to an infestation of malevolent spirits. As events unfolded, the Snedeker family were terrorized by demonic occurrences, tap water running with blood, children being mysteriously span around by invisible forces, and the family waking up to toe tags attached to them like that of a corpse. Now, this case has been hotly disputed, and the Warrens were famously criticized for their involvement with the Snedeker family, who were reportedly involved in some serious drug and alcohol abuse, which formed the basis of their paranormal claims, rather than actually being terrorized by a demonic spirit. Nevertheless, Ed and Lorraine stood by their involvement as one of the most terrifyingly paranormal occurrences throughout their entire career, and Lorraine maintains this stance long after Ed Warren's passing. Number five on this list is the recording of an exorcism that Ed and Lorraine Warren facilitated on a man that was possessed by several demons. Before I break it down, let's roll a little bit of a clip so you guys can get a sense as to how far gone this man actually was. What other entity is inside you? God is commanding you. In the name of Jesus Christ, and all the saints, and all the martyrs, and all the angels command you to answer that question. What is it? Abaddon. Abaddon. Okay, who else? Who else is within you? Answer the question. So as you can see, Ed is standing with a cross to our man who is possessed and basically holding these spirits at bay, trying to figure out exactly who and what is inside of him. He mentions two names in that clip, Avatar and Maveth, two very inhuman and demonic names. He also isn't acting even remotely okay in this video. Clearly there's an inner battle going on between this man and the demons that are inside of him. Later in this clip, when the man was asked why these demons were inside of him, this is what he responded with. Why are you in Roberto? Why are you there with Roberto? Jesus Christ doesn't like demonic spirits within a human spirit. Jesus Christ hates demonic spirits to be within a human being, you know that? You hate Jesus, huh? The man clearly says that the demons are in him for power and that he hates Jesus Christ. Incredibly chilling stuff, if you ask me. And at number four, the Smurl haunting. In between 1974 and 1989, a couple by the name of Jack and Janet Smurl, who lived in West Pittston, Pennsylvania, claimed that a demon inhabited their home. Jack and Janet began witnessing strange happenings, the likes of loud noises and bad odors. The torment continued to get worse. Their dog was thrown into a wall, their daughter was pushed down their stairs, and Jack claims to have been physically and sexually assaulted by the demon on multiple occasions. The Warrens didn't get involved in the case until 1986, and the reports were pretty disturbing. 
disturbing. Ed claimed to see a dark mass form inside of the home, and that the temperature dropped severely. The demon even left them a message written on a mirror that read, Get out. By 1987, the haunting had calmed down to an extent, with Janet telling reporters that they still heard knocking and saw shadows occasionally. After the Smurls left the house, the new house owner told reporters in 1988 that she never encountered anything supernatural while living there. The Smurl haunting had generated a lot of press attention over the years, and there were a lot of doubts about the legitimacy of the Smurls' claims. And at number three, the Perrin family. You might recognize the Perrin family as the story that is depicted in the first Conjuring film. Now, back in January of 1971, the Perrin family moved into an old farmhouse, a 14 room building in Rhode Island. Roger, Carolyn, and their five daughters began to notice strange occurrences shortly after moving in, like missing objects, odd noises, and small piles of dirt appearing in previously clean rooms. The girls began noticing spirits around the house, most of which were harmless, but some were a bit more aggressive. Things got worse. The spirits would cause their beds to rise off the floor and they would smell like rotting flesh. Carolyn researched the house and discovered that it had a long history of people dying from mysterious circumstances, with some hanging themselves in the attic, and others drowning in the creek nearby. One spirit in particular, Bathsheba, was a spirit of a woman who lived on the property in the mid 1800s, who was a Satanist, and was somehow involved in the death of a neighbor's child. The Warrens visited the farmhouse multiple times, and on one occasion, Lorraine conducted a seance, which led to Carolyn becoming possessed and speaking in tongues. The family, due to financial strain, was forced to live in the house until 1980, but reportedly the hauntings had ceased by then. Up next, number two, the Enfield Poltergeist. The Enfield Poltergeist is the story that appears in the second Conjuring film. In 1977, the Hodgson family, who lived in Enfield, England, began to see and hear strange things in their home, including a dresser sliding across one of the children's bedrooms. Toys would fly around the house and were burning hot to the touch. Loud knocking sounds shook the house, to the point where they had to call the police, believing that someone was trying to break into their home. The officer who came to the scene reported seeing a chair rise up into the air and move across the floor, all on its own. Reporters from the Daily Mirror were also present at one point, and they claimed that they had also witnessed some of these strange occurrences. The situation really started to attract some solid attention when one day, the iron fireplace in one of the bedrooms upstairs was ripped out of the wall. Warrens came to the house and upon investigating declared that there was a demonic presence there. While the film depicts an almost exorcism, the real life story is quite different. Two years after the hauntings began, they abruptly stopped. And finally, in at number one, Amityville. Even if you're unfamiliar with the specifics of this story, you've probably at some point heard the name Amityville in correlation with horror or hauntings. Amityville is a real life place, approximately 30 miles outside of New York City. And back in 1974, a 23-year-old man named Ronald J. DeFeo Jr. murdered his entire family with a rifle while they slept. 13 months afterwards, a new family purchased the house, the Lutz family, who stayed there for 28 days before fleeing. The Lutz family claimed that their house was haunted by a violent spirit. After their first night there, the family began constantly constantly getting into arguments. Their daughter started to spend all of her time playing with imaginary friend named Jody. Awful odors emanated from all over the house, and black stains started to appear on various surfaces. Flies started to appear in one of the upstairs rooms that they had turned into a sewing room. George Lutz, the father, would always wake up at 3.15 am, the time in which the DeFeo murders occurred according to the police. Family members started to appear aged, and would levitate. So finally they got a priest to walk through the house. But the family still continued to be terrorized. 20 days after the family left the house, the Warrens were called in to investigate. While they were there, Ed was violently pushed to the floor and Lorraine was overwhelmed by a demonic presence, and saw the psychic impressions of the DeFeo family's bodies laid along the floor. Further research into the house revealed that it was actually the site used by a man named John Ketchum in the early 1900s, who practiced black magic. They also captured an image of a boy peering from the second floor of the house. The Lutzes eventually sold all of their belongings, some to the Warrens, and relocated to California. Starting us off in at number 5, Annabelle. Here we have a clip of Lorraine Warren that's fairly recent talking about the real life Annabelle doll. The doll, which was given to a college student by her mother as a gift, turned out to be a doll that was manipulated by a demon in an attempt to possess her or her roommate. The events surrounding the doll and why Ed and Lorraine were brought in are eerie at best. It began with the doll moving around the house on its own, and even resulted in one of their friends being brutally attacked by it, with the doll strangling him. Here's what Lorraine had to say about it when the second film inspired by the doll, Annabelle Creation, came out. Evil needs a body to go into, and if you're vulnerable, it's gonna be evil. In it for Ahn Chayanne Johnson. The trial of Ahn Chayanne Johnson is baffling and the first known case in the US that used the devil made me do it as its defense. On the night of February 16th, 1981, Johnson, who was just 19 years old at the time, was out for dinner with his fiance and their landlord, Alan Bono. Johnson stabbed Bono multiple times using his pocket knife and later went on to plead not guilty by possession, a defense that was founded on Johnson's relationship with his fiance's brother, David. In 1980, David woke up to what he described as a man 
with big black eyes, a thin face with animal features and jagged teeth, pointed ears, horns and hoofs. The demon like creature scared David so much that he turned to his sister Ann Johnson for help. They turned to a priest which only angered the entity more, causing it to make David hiss and quote Paradise Lost. The Warrens were brought in, and during one particular interview they stated, I quote, While Ed interviewed the boy, I saw a black misty form next to him, which told me we were dealing with something of a negative nature. Soon the child was complaining that invisible hands were choking him, and there were red marks on him. He said that he had a feeling of being hit. The Warrens worked alongside four priests to exercise more than 40 demons from David. However, Johnson seemed to be the new target, and after he stabbed his landlord he was found guilty of first degree manslaughter, after his claims of possession didn't hold up in court. Coming in at 3, Annabelle the Doll. This case follows the now infamous Annabelle doll, a Raggedy Ann doll that was purchased in an antique store. It was gifted to the buyer's daughter, a nursing student. However, the student and her roommate very quickly began to notice odd occurrences involving the doll, including her changing positions and even leaving notes. Horrible. The messages eventually escalated and blood even appeared on the doll's dress. Annabelle seemed to take aim at the fiance of one of the roommates, who claims he woke up one night frozen in bed as the doll crawled up his body and tried to strangle him. He also claimed that upon entering a dark room where the doll was sat, he felt something attack him. When he turned on the lights, he saw his stomach covered in bloody scratches, with the doll now on the floor. The Warrens were eventually called in, and they explained that the doll was possessed by the spirit of a deceased seven-year-old girl named Annabelle Higgins, which supposedly died on the land where the apartment stood. However, it was later determined by the Warrens that a demonic presence was in fact behind the doll. They ended up performing a blessing in the home before taking Annabelle and housing her in the Warrens Occult Museum. Coming in at 2, the Amateurville case. This is perhaps the Warrens most famous paranormal case, with the investigation being adapted into many frightening and unending films. The case involved the Lutz family, who took up residence in a suburban home in Amateurville, Long Island in 1975, just one year after a deadly mass murder occurred on the property, which saw Ronald DeFeo Jr. brutally kill six members of his family. For 28 days the Lutzes were antagonised by spirits, they heard voices, saw swarms of flies and were inflicted with welts. The Warrens were eventually called in to cleanse the home, bringing with them a local TV crew. While there they snapped a handful of pictures, including one that seemed to show a boy with glowing eyes. The Warrens ultimately determined that the land was cursed, and Lorraine considered it to be the one case that continuously haunted her, stating, Amateurville was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. It followed us right straight across the country. I will never go in the Amateurville house ever again." End quote. And lastly, coming in at number 1, the Perrin family haunting. This now infamous case follows the Perrins, a family that moved to an idyllic 200 acre home in Harrisville, Rhode Island, a home that hid some very dark and disturbing secrets. The home was originally built in 1736 and was inhabited by Bathsheba Thea and her four children, three of whom died young. The deaths and circumstances around the deaths drew in a lot of suspicion within the town, resulting in them ostracizing Bathsheba, who was ultimately labelled a satanist by her community. She then went on to hang herself in her own backyard. Now, during the parents' stay at the home, they experienced a lot of ghostly interactions, including spirits playing with her children. Bathsheba also appeared to them, only she was far more menacing than the children that haunted the residence. They heard disembodied voices and watched on as furniture moved on its own. The Perrin family also stated that Bathsheba targeted the mother, Carolyn, and was jealous of her motherhood. The Warrens were ultimately brought in to help the family in 1974, however the presence only worsened the situation, so much so that the family asked the Warrens to leave. Coming in at number 5 we have the White Lady of Easton. Located in Easton, Connecticut, Union Cemetery is a site that dates back to the 1700s. And according to ghost hunters and paranormal investigators, it is one of the most haunted cemeteries in all of the United States. Now, according to local legend, a ghost haunts Union Cemetery, who has been dubbed the White Lady. She's also said to haunt Stepney Cemetery in Monroe as well. She is described as wearing a white nightgown or a wedding dress esque outfit, with demonologist Ed Warren once claiming to have physical evidence to support these claims. Now, claims of paranormal occurrences at the cemetery had been occurring for decades prior to Ed and Lorraine Warren investigating the location. Ed Warren and several Eastern police officers visited the site, which is when Ed supposedly caught the apparition on camera. Ed claimed that several ghost lights came together to form the shape of a woman who had no facial features, but had dark hair and was wearing a white dress. Terrifying. Now, there isn't a whole lot of information about the ghost or the cemetery, however, Ed and Lorraine Warren wrote a book about the location entitled Graveyard. Maybe check it out. You do you. Before we jump into number four, be sure to give this video a big thumbs up. It really helps out a lot. 
Coming in at number four, we have the werewolf in London. Bill Ramsey from Southend on Sea in England was considered living proof that werewolves actually exist. Now, the first inkling of trouble for Bill came when he was just nine years old. One day, he was outside in his garden playing when he began to feel strange. An icy blast swept all over him. Perspiration froze on his skin and a foul stench made him need to vomit. Then, out of nowhere, anger and rage took over and young Bill uprooted a fence post, with the fence still attached, and began swinging it around like a club. Should be noted that not even his parents could remove that fence post. Now, all returned to normal for a while. Ramsey grew up, became a loving husband and father of three, and was instant free up until the 1960s. During this time, he began to be plagued by nightmares, cold sweats, and waking up panting like a wild animal. Not long after, he began to feel the same sensations he had that day in the garden when he was nine. And on one occasion, he attacked a friend in a car on their way from a pub and manhandled police on several occasions. In turn, Ramsey was forced to spend time in the hospital where it was noted that he exhibited inhuman strength, growling, and his hands would often curl like claws. Ed and Lorraine Warren were thus called in to investigate. Ed Warren stated that, I quote, Ramsey would ask to be locked up in jail cell for his protection and the protection of the public. The Warrens then invited Ramsey to their Connecticut home where Bishop Robert McKenna would perform a recorded exorcism on Ramsey. Coming in at number three, we have the Enfield Poltergeist. Between the years of 1977 and 1979, the Enfield poltergeist terrorized a small London house in the Enfield suburb. The case involved two sisters, aged 11 and 13. In August 1977, single parent Peggy Hodgson called police to her home, claiming she had witnessed furniture moving and that two of her four children said that knocking sounds were heard on their walls. The children included Margaret, who was 13 at the time, and Janet, who was 11. A police officer who investigated the scene recalled seeing a chair wobble and slide, but could not determine the cause of movement. Later, claims included disembodied voices, overturned chairs, and the children even levitating. Over the next year and a half, more than 30 people said that they saw heavy furniture moving on its own accord, objects being thrown around the room, and the children levitating. These people included psychic researchers, neighbors, and journalists. Creepier still, the young daughter Janet was also recorded speaking in a deep masculine voice, which was believed to be the spirit of an old man. Of course, the the Warrens were called in to investigate this paranormal behavior, which they found was a case of demonic possession. Janet later went on to admit that she had played with a Ouija board prior to the disturbances, and that she was unaware that she fell into the trances until she saw photographs later on. However, many have called the Enfield poltergeist fake, with Janet being detected in trickery with a video camera catching her bending spoons and attempting to bend an iron bar. So whatever you believe is up to you, legend or reality. Coming in at number two, we have the Smurl family. The Smurl haunting refers to claims made by Jack and Janet Smurl, who alleged that a demon inhabited their home between 1974 and 1989. The family moved to West Pittson, Pennsylvania with their young daughters and Jack's parents, who all lived together in one house, and supposedly suffered the worst 13 years of their entire lives. Not long after moving into their new home, they claimed that the premises was disturbed by a demon that caused loud noises and bad odors. Through their dog into a wall, shuck their mattress, push one of their daughters down a flight of stairs, and physically and sexually assaulted Jack on several occasions. The family were terrified and called in Ed and Lorraine Warren for help. The pair quickly discovered that the family home was infested with four spirits, an elderly woman who was harmless, an old man who had died at the house, a young and violent girl, and a demon that controlled the other spirits and had turned them against the family. By 1987, the family decided to leave the home once and for all, and two years later, a church sanctioned exorcism took place there, and the property was cleared of all paranormal activity. And finally, coming in at number one, we have the Amityville Horror. The Amityville Horror is perhaps one of the, if not the most famous paranormal cases Ed and Lorraine Warren investigated. However, like the rest of our list, there is always debate as to how much was actually true. Some backstory to begin though. On November 13th, 1974, at 3.15am, Ronald DeFeo Jr. killed his parents and siblings with a rifle while they were sleeping peacefully in their beds. Around a year later, the Lutz family moved into the home on Ocean Drive. However, after just 28 days, the Lutzes left the house, claiming to have been terrorized by paranormal phenomena while living there. Supposedly, during their time living there, a priest was called in to bless the home, and he warned the family, do not use the upstairs room as a bedroom, and do not let anyone sleep in there. Within days, things began to go wrong for the happy family. Their young daughter made an 
imaginary friend with a red-eyed pig. Foul odours filled each room, furniture moved and levitated, and banging would frequently be heard throughout the house at night, in turn forcing the family to flee. Enter Ed and Lorraine Warren. The pair investigated the house and soon discovered that the land the house had been built on had previously been used by a practicing black magician who had requested to be buried on the land, and he remains there to this day. A TV crew was also called in to film the investigation, with them snapping a photo that seemed to show a boy with glowing eyes. In a 2013 interview, Lorraine Warren said that the Amityville house was the one case that haunted her the most. She also went on to state during a press conference for the Conjuring, I quote, Amityville was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. It followed us straight across the country. I will never go to the Amityville house ever again. Whether you believe the story or not, something certainly spooked the Warrens enough to never return there again. Starting off this countdown, we have the ghost in the photographs. In this footage, we see Ed and Lorraine Warren discussing a number of cases where they caught photographic evidence of ghosts. The show was hosted by Tony Spira, the Warrens' son-in-law. The first case they talk about revolves around a woman named Gail Martin, who who we also see here. Basically, Gail moved into a house and for the longest time, nothing spooky happened. Then one day she was out digging in the backyard and gardening. Her husband took a photo of her doing so and when it developed, you could see a white silhouette of a ghost. Ten years ago it was taken. Here, here it, was it taken. is. Here, okay, here it, it is, is. Tony. Now, you see that Gail is higher than that woman. Then we have a second photo taken of Gail on the same day. And again, we see the same ghost in the shot. Now, as you notice, Gail turns around and Gail is smiling. And because her husband is saying something funny. So at that point, the woman is smiling and she puts her hand up to her mouth in that manner. Unfortunately, since it's old footage, it is hard to see the ghost in the photo, like its face. It just kind of looks like a white blob. Now, Lorraine actually made contact with this ghost, and that's when we learned about her sad story. So according to Lorraine, the woman in the photograph once had a child who she absolutely loved. She even built a place for him on her property for him to stay, so he was always close to her. Then one summer, he was working at a children's camp when there was a polio epidemic. Sadly, her son contracted polio and three days later passed away. The mother was extremely heartbroken by this. So when she passed away, she stayed attached to this piece of land. Now, when Gail started gardening, the ghost made herself known because someone was working on the piece of land that was sacred to her. It's out in the yard, in the garden, and now you're doing something to improve that after all of these years probably of neglect. Now you're going to be fixing it. And I believe that that is the reason she's there. The next ghost that they talk about though is not as nice as the first one. Let's take a look at it. Above the chair, right? Right above the chair. Right. Now this is in the lowest level of that property, but they did have a lot, unlike Gail, they had all sorts of infestation. So the couple who owned this house witnessed really dark paranormal activity, and that's when they contacted the Warrens for help to get this evil spirit out of their house. And lastly, we have the Providence Ghost Man. This next ghost that they are going to be talking about is of a soldier in World War II. The story is very sad and scary. His wife was informed that he was killed in action, not yeah. even missing that he was actually killed in action. And then a week later, she committed suicide. She committed suicide, and one week after that, he was found alive. That is just heartbreaking. His wife literally took her own life thinking her husband died, when in reality, he was just missing in action. Both of the ghosts are said to be attached to that home still. In fact, no one has moved into that home since. If you look at the top right of this next clip, you'll see the ghostly image of this man. No one ever occupied that cottage again. That. Oh, now that looks like uh, a that's man, right. yes. but we have other photographs which look like a woman. Yes, we do. So where you have one spirit, you have, you have many more other than one. Mm -hmm. Yes. Coming in at number four, we've got the Smurl Succubus. 
Anytime a succubus or incubus gets involved, you know things are going to get tricky. Humans are often weak in the face of temptation, and this kind of thing does not exclude famous demonologists. I won't go too deep into the details here, but Ed and Lorraine are not universally loved, and there are some very questionable stories about the two and their predispositions. This comes into play during the investigation of the Smurl family. In the mid 80s, this family contacted Ed and Lorraine for help with their haunting. After moving into their house over a decade ago, they'd experienced numerous terrifying ordeals. Their dog was thrown against the wall with force by an unseen presence. Their daughter was pushed down the stairs. Jack Smurl's ear was bitten, and both he and his wife Janet were by a demon. The last was apparently a succubus or an incubus, and you know what kind of assault those demons are interested in. So when Ed and Lorraine arrived on the scene, they already knew what was going on. Confirming that the Smurl house was indeed haunted, they got to work trying to figure out what to do about it. During their time investigating, Ed noticed a strange dark mass, and it really put him on edge. Apparently he was also left a message by the dark forces at play, one that read, Get out. And that didn't go over well with Ed. Wanting to defeat this succubus, Ed came back with holy water and rosaries. He used these tools to fight against the demon, but to little avail. Apparently he was thrown 10 feet through the air by the demon and attacked on multiple occasions. Had he stuck around much longer, who knows what would have happened. In the end, he admitted he was not strong enough to deal with this presence and reached out to the Vatican. They sent an exorcism team and the house was indeed eventually cleansed. A happy ending for sure, but that is definitely a close call for Ed and Lorraine, don't you think? Coming in at number 3, some Snedeker suspicions. In a different haunted house, this time occupied by the Snedeker family, another demon had a hold on their residence. Poltergeist attacks were common and the Snedekers were also being assaulted by whatever presence was inside. The house, which was once a funeral parlor, was home to many terrible experiments and abuses upon the deceased. It was said that the man running the place beforehand would use corpses in dark rituals and even use the bodies for unspeakable acts. So when Ed and Lorraine showed up, they had a lot to do. After hearing stories of the Snedekers being grabbed and their clothes being tampered with, they reached out to the local church and performed an exorcism. This could have ended poorly, as Ed admitted that the presence was terrible and diabolical. Had this exorcism gone south, all involved could have been hurt, possessed, or worse. Coming in at number 2, we've got the Union Cemetery sighting. Here's another famous case. In fact, the notoriety of the ghosts present here goes beyond Ed and Lorraine's influence. They added to it for sure, but the White Lady of Union Cemetery is well known all on her own, thank you very much. So much so that she's contributed to many classic urban legends. Now when does she get a movie, right? Well, regardless of movie magic, Ed almost fell victim to this particular ghost one time. Although to be honest, she seems more benevolent than malevolent. Attracting all sorts of paranormal enthusiasts from across the United States, the white lady has made quite a name for herself. Late night motorists might notice a pale figure ahead on the map and slow down to see if they need help. Often she'll just disappear at that point, but sometimes she'll try to hitch a ride with them back to the cemetery itself. Ed and Lorraine took a trip to Union to see what they could find and ended up running into the white lady herself. Trusty video camera in hand, Ed supposedly captured footage of the white lady. The evidence is so controversial and important that it was kept hidden for years. To this day, the legitimacy of this footage is called into question and I'm sure that the ghost herself wasn't too happy about being potentially caught on camera. One has to wonder if she made any attempt to prevent the warrants from getting a good shot. And finally at number 1 we've got the Perron predicament. Most folks would be happy to have some famous demonologists on their side when fighting off whatever's invaded their home. However, if it's not going so well or if you haven't heard of the folks trying to help you, things could play out a little differently. Although the Warren's involvement with the Perron family is the focal point of the first Conjuring movie, things didn't exactly play out that way. After the Perrons purchased their Rhode Island home, things started getting weird. They experienced a number of paranormal attacks from all sorts of vengeful spirits. At a loss, they reached out to a number of paranormal experts, eventually being visited by the Warrens. However, this didn't help out all that much. In fact, the patriarch of the Perron family eventually had to ask the Warrens to leave his family alone, as their intervention seemed to be making the demons angrier. Hell, they might have been egging the demons on to go bigger. Maybe if they stuck around a little bit longer, the demons would have found a way into the Warrens. It wouldn't be too surprising considering how upset the Perrons were at the amount of help they were getting. Wild, right? You can't always trust the movie for the full story. 